speaker for today, the last day of the conference, Anna Lubu. Uh, Anna is a professor at David Sheraton School of Computer Science, University of Waterloo. Uh, she's recipient of a number of awards from University of Waterloo, and she's also ACM Distinguished Scholar. Something you may not know about Anna is that she's also a violinist. She plays in University of Waterloo Orchestra and organizes it. Um, academically or retry, she worked in diverse fields, but concentrated mainly on computational geometry and uh, graph theory. Uh, she made many fundamental uh, contributions to these fields. Some of my favorite, her beautiful fold and cut theorem, uh, the result of morphing one planar graph into another, a number of flattening polyhedral results, and more recently, a beautiful characterization of when one edge labeled triangulation can be transformed in another via edge flips. Anna is also a co-chair of several conferences in computational geometry, CCG, graph drawing, and was the program committee on essentially all the conferences um, in her fields of research. Uh, I was trying to figure out when we met many years ago, so we know each other for years, probably for decades, uh, so I would like to end with something that strikes me about Anna is that she's very collaborative, very generous with her time and openly shares her ideas with colleagues and students. So it, it's wonderful to collaborate with her. So I'm looking forward for, to hear her talk about token swapping. And she's an excellent speaker and you will see that too. Thank you. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, Vida, and uh, thank you for inviting me to, to give this talk. So yeah, I'm going to talk about token swapping and, and happy tokens. So um, it'll be a happy talk. So token swapping is a reconfiguration problem, and uh, there's lots of very attractive reconfiguration problems. Um, token swapping actually includes the, this one, the, the 15 puzzle here. Uh, so I'll tell you about that. And one difference I will point out here is that uh, sometimes with reconfiguration, like here with the 15 puzzle, we know exactly where everything should go. And other times we don't, like in this sliding coins puzzle or here in this chess puzzle, all of the white pawns look identical and I don't know which one is which. So that distinction will um, arise during this talk. Now, um, one way to think about um, reconfiguration. Well, first, I wanted to point out these two lovely surveys on reconfiguration problems, um, one by Vanden Hubel and one by Naomi Nishimura, who's my colleague at Waterloo. And both of them start, you'll notice, with the 15 puzzle as the example that they're giving. And, uh, now, I'll start um, with something what? that's even... Yeah. yeah Sorry, I don't I think, think that... we... Yeah. I'm not sure you we are seeing your slides, just seeing the, the, the title slide. Oh my goodness. Um, I'm seeing it. Let me try stopping the sharing and uh, sharing it again. It happens sometimes and I'm not sure. Oh no, now it's fine. Oh, try going backwards and forward, just. Yeah. Did you see it yes. switch here? Yeah. Good. Yes. Okay. Now, now it's fine. So, yeah. So the only, so I had this picture. Did you miss this picture? Oh, no. Okay. We so, did. Oh, okay. <laughs> this is one of the best pictures. So, <laughs> um, so this is an example of various reconfiguration problems. Token swapping is a reconfiguration problem. And it, uh, it includes the 15 puzzle. So I'll explain that. Um, here I was talking about the two surveys available about reconfiguration and pointing out that they both start with describing the 15 puzzle. Um, and you can still see this slide now about sorting. Let me check. Good. So I wanted to start with this really simple example of token swapping. And it's just about sorting a list where we're restricted in what we can do we can only exchange consecutive pairs. So for example, I can switch uh, six and one here. I could not in one move take one and put it where it belongs at the beginning of the list. So we're asking how many of these swaps of consecutive elements do I need in order to sort the list? So 
um, you know, it's like bubble sorts. And if the list were in reverse order, then every pair of elements, no matter you know, how far apart they are in the list, every pair of elements is out of order. And we need to eventually swap them to get them in the correct order. So the number of pairs is the number of swaps that we're going to need, right? And even better than that, we can tell for a given list, like for example, this one, it's not in reverse order. It's not gonna take uh, six choose two, um, but I can just count how many of these pairs are inverted. And that's the number of swaps that I will need. So this is a very well understood example. Um, now, one way to understand this, the, the maximum number and the number I need for a given input is by way of something called the reconfiguration graph. So a reconfiguration graph has a vertex for every configuration. In this case, I've gone down to a list of length four. So how many configurations are there for factorial uh, or 24 different ones? Here I have the list in sorted order. Up here, I have the list in reverse order. And that thing I was asking, oh, and the edges here are the swaps. They're, they're color coded to indicate which, which pair it is that we're swapping. Um, so that question of what is the worst case number of swaps I need becomes a question of what is the diameter of this graph and, uh, and choose two in general. And um, uh, in this particular, so with token swapping and other problems where the reconfiguration is, has, a, has a group structure underlying it, then that reconfiguration graph is called a Cayley graph. And even in this even more special case, when we're sorting a list by consecutive swaps, that Cayley graph, that reconfiguration graph, actually has a geometric structure and it's called a permutohedron. So that's the picture I've drawn here, the picture of the permutohedron. Um, now, that question of finding the distance between two given configurations, like these two here, um, becomes what's the shortest path in this graph between those two nodes? Now, we sure don't want to do it by generating the whole graph and running a shortest path algorithm, right? So when I say that it can be found in polynomial time, just by counting the number of pairs out of order, I mean relative to n, not to the n factorial size of this graph. Okay, so um, it, as I said, these reconfiguration graphs are the way I'll sort of formulate a bunch of these things. And so just to uh, give you perspective on some of the other reconfiguration problems here, um, the Rubik's cube has like 43 quintillion different configurations and the diameter of that reconfiguration graph for it is 20. Maybe you know that as God's number. Um, the diameter uh, then is, it, it, well, it's also interesting to look as we grow asymptotically an n by n by n cube, and there the diameter is known to grow as n squared over log n. The 15 puzzle on the other hand has um, this many, I'm saying reachable configurations because if you've ever looked at the 15 puzzle, you know there's a parity issue. If I detached my little squares and flipped two of them, I will never get it back into the sorted order. So uh, the configura reconfiguration graph has two big connected components, each of half the configurations. And the diameter of each connected component is 80. And as n grows, that diameter grows as n cubed, um, which this difference between 20 and 80 might be why somehow the Rubik's cube is more intriguing and satisfying. Uh, it, way more configurations, but a smaller diameter. Anyway, um, in both cases, I wanted to point out that that distance problem is NP complete. Um, for the general n, right? Otherwise it's a finite problem. Okay, so let me finally uh, introduce you to this token swapping problem. So it generalizes the swaps I was doing on a list by saying, instead of having a path, I have a general graph. So the input is a graph. Um, I've numbered the vertices from one to n and I have distinct tokens from one to n that are placed initially at vertices of the graph. And um, our goal is to rearrange, so permute these tokens, and I want to get token i to vertex v sub i. So for example, here, token five, 
I want it to go over here to vertex five. Token three is sitting there and I want it to go to vertex three. Token one is sitting here and I want it to go to vertex one. So this is one of the cycles I wish to implement, one of the cycles in the permutation. So um, I could just as well tell you, oh, here is the initial configuration of tokens and here is the final configuration of tokens. And I've just done that instead with my vertex numbering. That's one way to do it. So what do we get to do in this token swapping problem? We get to do swaps. And that means to exchange the tokens on an edge. So um, let's look at this a little more. Uh, first of all, notice that token four is happy. It's on vertex four, it's where it wants to be, uh, but we can't leave it there and accomplish uh, getting everyone else to, to their happy states. Um, for example, token six here wants to go over there and I really need to bump four out of the way in order to do it. So one swap we might do is to exchange four and six. The result would be this. Now token six is getting closer to where it wants to go but token four has become unhappy. It's no longer at the right vertex. Um, I could then next send token six to its home, for example, with this one more swap. Okay, so um, let me ask if there's any questions at this point, because understanding what this problem is, is sort of the rest of the talk depends on this. So if there's anything you feel is ambiguous here or not fully explained, then please interrupt and ask about it. And in general, in the rest of the talk, I'm happy to get questions during the talk. Okay, so we wanna do this with a minimum number of swaps. It's the distance problem uh, that I was referring to. Now, the number of configurations that we get here is n factorial because any possible uh, uh, permutation of the tokens corresponds to a configuration. And um, the first thing I wanna show you is that these configurations are connected. In fact, that the diameter of that reconfiguration graph is at most n squared. So that's a, quite an easy thing. Um, we choose the spanning tree in the graph, uh, choose a leaf, a visa by of the spanning tree. And then I say, oh, where's the token that should go to that vertex visa by? And it, you know, maybe we're talking about uh, vertex five as our leaf. I say, oh, it's token five that I want to go there. There's some path in my spanning tree that would take that token there. And I'm gonna do swaps on all the edges along that path until token five gets to its leaf, uh, V sub five. And then I'm gonna forget about that leaf and just recurse on the rest. You know, As five move, the other tokens jumbled up somehow. I don't care how, I just repeat this procedure. Okay. Now the distance problem for token swapping on graphs um, was proved to be NP complete in 2016. And um, to tell you a little more history about this problem though, um, it, was, it was only called token swapping fairly recently in a 2015 paper. Um, and, but it has a much older history than that. So first of all, Cayley was looking at this when he was uh, defining Cayley graphs. He was looking at it for a clique. So the graph is complete and I can swap any pairs that I want. And he analyzed exactly how many swaps do you need? Um, it's actually quite easy to see that if I imagine here that I had the complete graph and I say, oh, token five wants to go over there. Let, let me do a swap. So five goes over here in one swap, three comes here. Now three and one need to swap and I'm done with that cycle, right? So the cycle of length three here is accomplished with two swaps. And in general, what I need is N minus the number of cycles, number of swaps. That's what Cayley proved. Um, the case of a path, which is what I showed you first, uh, Knuth dealt with very thoroughly in his art of computer programming. And um, I'll tell you also about some other graphs, stars, and uh, it's known for cycles and uh, some other uh, nice classes of graphs. Um, for trees, that is going to be the topic of my talk here. So a um, little more on history. Token swapping, uh, in spite of being named token swapping only relatively recently, it's been studied for a long time. 
it's been studied in different fields by different people using different terminology and not knowing about each other. So it's been quite sort of a, a detective work to try to find, you know, how many independent proofs are there that token swapping can be solved on a star, for example. Um, so people in combinatorics, people in algorithms, uh, people coming from the pattern matching community where they start with a string and they're swapping and they say, oh, sometimes we want more than just a linear string. Um, I'll show you an application in networks uh, for robot motion planning, which I've also listed here. You can think of one token as being your robot that you want to go to a particular place and it has to swap with boxes along its route to get there. Um, and also in game theory, where they often have the notion that you should do a swap only if each vertex prefers the new token that it receives because of the swap. And then they're analyzing this. Um, that actually makes the problem easier when there's preferences like that. And there've also been many variants that have been looked at. Um, one is when some of the tokens have the same color. So I mentioned that back in my first or second slide. Um, if, if I have two red tokens and I don't care which is which, then it's no longer a group theory problem. Um, and I have the choice of which of those red tokens goes to the red vertices. We can also have weights on the tokens. Um, the 15 puzzle I promised to tell you about, um, it's just the case where the swaps are special. They only can involve the whole. In the 15 puzzle, I cannot take two of the numbered tiles and swap them. It's only the whole that can swap with something. And more generally, we can have a notion that there are some privileged tokens that can participate in swaps. And even more generally, one can think that there is a graph that tells you which pairs of tokens are allowed to swap. Um, so, and what else? Uh, another variant is to do swaps in parallel on independent edges. That is at any round, I can choose a matching in the graph and swap simultaneously on an, all the edges of the matching. And that also has a distinguished history. Um, Noga Alon, Fan Chung, and Ron Graham considered that in 95, 94. And so there's a slew of papers that have followed after that. Um, I'm mentioning here a couple of other complexity results, uh, again, for general graphs. Um, it's known to be, uh, it's known that there's no PTAS, on the other hand, it's known that there is a four approximation algorithm for general graphs for the distance problem. And um, also known to be uh, W1 hard with respect to the distance. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you about token swapping on trees. So here's a little gallery of different kinds of trees. Um, and why would we care about token swapping on trees? Um, that was one of the first main um, uh, explorations of token swapping was for trees in this paper from 89 by Akers and Krishnamurthy. And it's been cited 1600 times. That's an awful lot of times that a paper's been cited. And why were they interested in token swapping on trees? It's because they were interested in sorting networks and you're probably all aware that like the hypergraph makes a good sorting network. And their claim was that the Cayley graph, the reconfiguration graph of token swapping on a tree makes an even better sorting network than the hypercube. So let me show you that for the star. So the size of the hypercube is two to the N. Uh, the reconfiguration graph, the Cayley graph for a star is N factorial size because I have all the possible permutations of my N tokens. In both cases, the degree is like linear and the connectivity is the same as the degree, which is a nice property. These are well-connected graphs, huge well-connected graphs. And the advantage comes down here, which is that the diameter of the hypercube, it's N, it's the distance from the zero, zero, zero to the one, one, one. I have to make N switches to get there. On the other hand, the diameter of the Cayley graph for the star, I'll show you this result later, but it's three halves n. In other words, it is sub-logarithmic. The diameter is even less than logarithmic because log of n factorial would give us n log n. So we're looking at a, a smaller diameter. And that was their point. That, that was the advantage of, of um, reconfiguration graphs for token swapping on trees. Okay. 
So also to sort of whet your appetite for token swapping on trees, I have this puzzle for you. Um, I call it the double bubble sort puzzle. I have to be careful not to say double bubble because then it comes out really funny. So I have a path, uh, this time I have two paths. I have my red path and I want to sort the tokens there. I want it to go one to 99. I, have, I want to reverse them. I have a blue path. And again, I want to reverse those tokens. And the one extra thing is that I have this one vertical edge joining the two paths in the middle. And the question is, if I want to do the minimum number of swaps to sort the reds, sort the blues, uh, should I use that vertical edge ever? Now you all know that because I'm asking you this question that the answer has to be, yes, you should use that vertical edge. But you must admit it's a little bit puzzling at first why you would ever want to mix up the reds and the blues to do this token swapping. And in fact, uh, Teresa Vaughn conjectured in 91 that if I have a tree and it has an edge such as this one where no token needs to cross over that edge, then there should be a minimum swap sequence it doesn't use that edge, sounds sensible. Um, an even more limited form of this conjecture is to say, what if that edge goes to a leaf of the tree? So if the tree has a leaf whose token is happy, like down here, uh, token 10 is happy where it is. It doesn't wanna move. I just wanna sort the path that's up above here. If this tree has a leaf that's happy, should I ever move that happy token? to get my minimum number of swaps. And this conjecture is false. So that's one of the first things I'd like to show you. Um, so the idea of it, before I actually get to that example, the idea of it is to consider this kind of tree, which I call a fork. So I would like to get it into this configuration. So it's sort of like reversing it, right? And if I take token 21 and just swap it to its home at the far right end, um, 21 doesn't swap with 20 as I do that, right? And I get this. Next, I'm gonna swap token 20 to its home, which is here, right? Um, and note that 20 doesn't swap with 19 as I do it. So I continue in this fashion. I'm, all, I'm alternating between the two prongs of the fork and just sending everybody home as I do it. And um, what am I getting this way? It takes 190 swaps versus if I had uh, tokens one to 21 on a path, it would take me 210. In other words, I'm saving 20. I'm saving one swap for each token. Well, except token one, yeah? So that's the secret to showing this counterexample to the ha happy leaf conjecture. So, if I fix token 10, I say, no, nope, it's going to stay there. It's happy and it's going to stay where it's happy. Um, then it's going to take me 36 swaps because I'm reversing a list of size nine. On the other hand, consider this. It's a better way. Um, I'm going to move token 10 with three swaps to the end of the list, and I'm going to park it there for a while. And now notice that I have exactly that fork situation that allows me to save. So I can send token nine to its home and it doesn't swap with seven. I can send eight home and it doesn't swap with seven. And then I'm in my regular pattern. So it's gonna take 27 swaps. You're adding up, I guess, uh, seven plus six plus five down to token four moves two places. Um, at the end, we, we have a little mess here that I have to fix up, but that's another four swaps. And in total, I'm taking 34 swaps instead of the 36 where I fixed that happy leaf. So that's this proof. Um, oh yeah, and then I have this beautiful animation that Eric Demain produced. I'm hoping it's gonna work. Um, yeah. So uh, now we're moving token eight that was. Uh, now we'll move token seven, which is down here. We jumped at the beginning. Token six, come up here. Next token five, next token four. And now I do that little cleanup. One, two, three, four uh, swaps to do the little cleanup there. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. And now to come back to this double bubble sort puzzle, um, 
what we could show is that if we have n tokens on each pass, so here n was 99, then um, it takes me uh, twice n choose two if I don't use this central edge. So in other words, n squared swaps without the vertical edge. But we can get by with just 0.9 n squared if we use this vertical edge. You, you can see that there's a, a fork here that I might use. And in fact, we use a, a kind of longer fork to, to make more things go by without swapping with each other. Um, on the other hand, we know that 0.5 n squared is a lower bound. So there is a gap here that we didn't try too hard to fill, but it might be interesting. Okay, so what am I gonna tell you about in this talk? First of all, the counterexample to that happy leaf conjecture, which we already did. I'll tell you about some polynomial time cases for the distance problem for token swapping on trees. Tell you about some approximation algorithms and NP hardness. So that's a, a new result to prove that token swapping on trees is an NP complete problem. Um, the work I'm gonna tell you about comes from two papers, each with lots of people. Um, so uh, the first paper here was the result of a Waterloo problem solving session. Tillman Miltza visited and told us about the token swapping problem. Yeah, Vida, do you have your hand up? Yes, um, I wanted to ask if is the secret or the key of this extra edge that you are actually reducing the diameter now of the problem of the graph in a sense. Um, yeah, that would be one way. You are hiding it. one element and it's kind of like you reduce the diameter and the diameter seems to play a role in this. Yeah, I mean, I guess we never tried to analyze for that particular uh, tree, like the two paths joined by mm -hmm. an edge. What's the worst case? We were assuming it's trying to reverse those two paths, but I don't even know that, right? But yeah, thinking about yeah. that in terms oh, okay. of diameter Thank would be a nice way. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. So yeah, this first paper was um, uh, a Waterloo group uh, with a couple of visitors from IST Austria. And um, then after that, a group of us in a workshop uh, worked on it. I'd like to bring attention to a few of the students who were involved. So. Susanna Masarova is a co-author in both of these. She was doing her PhD co-supervised by me and people at IST Austria. And some of this token swapping is in her thesis. Um, in the second paper, it was um, Michael Rudoy who had the, the, the absolute great suggestion of which problem to reduce from for our NP hardness proof. And it was Nicole Wine, who's a student currently at MIT and Jason Lynch, who just graduated from MIT who after the workshop spent months and months and months to make this NP hardness proof work. So just wanted to mention their name. And while I'm on names, I had said that this conjecture was made by Teresa Vaughn. And I presume that that name is not familiar to anyone here. It wasn't familiar to me. Um, so she was a researcher at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, a professor there, um, worked in these various areas and wrote at least four papers about token swapping that are not, I think, yet available online anywhere. And so all these other papers on token swapping tend not to refer to her. And, and she was working sort of in isolation, so neither did she refer to other work for the most part. Anyway, so let's look at some polynomial time cases. So um, token swapping on stars, first of all. So a star is a graph, a, tr a tree where everything's a leaf except the one node. And the structure is I can have some leaves that are happy. I may have a cycle that involves the central node and I may have some cycles that are just with the leaves. Of course, this cycle could be missing. I could only have cycles involving leaves then the center would be happy. That's my general situation. Now, this token one that wishes to go to that leaf, it's sort of clear that that's something you might as well do right away. And what happens when you do it, the size of the cycle goes down by one, right? So it's clear that I can solve this cycle of size four using four swaps. And that's the best I'm gonna be able to do. After I do that, now I have all of this part of the tree is happy and I'm just left with these cycles. Now for these ones, I really need to displace the token at the center in order to get anywhere. So I'm gonna need 
instead of just three swaps, I'm going to need one extra one to start to involve the centered token. So instead of just three swaps, I need an extra one. I need a fourth swap for this. And this one, which has four leaves, I need five swaps for that, which justifies, at least vaguely, that the minimum number of swaps I need is going to be the number of unhappy leaves plus the number of non-trivial cycles that don't use the center. And from that, we can get the diameter as well, because I can make all my n minus one leaves unhappy, and I can make them all involved in cycles of size two so that I have n over two cycles. And that's how we get this. I wrote it earlier as three over two n when I was talking about the, the sorting network. Um, now this result is one of the ones that I was saying, it was proved by Akers and Krishnamurthy in their paper. Uh, Vaughn and the co-author proved it and Igor Pak proved it, I don't know, a decade later independently of all these other things. So, um, and one thing I'd like you to know is how different this is from token swapping on a path where we were just counting number of inversions. We didn't need to pay attention to the cycles in the permutation or, or anything like that. Um, now, in fact, there is a way to extend that and do colored token swapping on a star. So here, for example, I have three red tokens. They want to go to these two red vertices, but I don't care which red one goes where. And um, an algorithm for that was given by Bonet and Tokoman Milto and uh, co-author. Um, and one of the things we were able to do is to extend this to show that we can solve with colors and weights on a star. And somewhat surprisingly that the colors and the weights sort of separate out. And I don't fully understand that phenomenon, but it happens as well for paths. Um, but I think I will not say too much about this just because I think my talk is over full perhaps. So here's another um, good idea that occurred independently to a whole number of people. So if we can do paths and we can do stars, why can't we combine them? So we call this a broom. I think, mm, I think some other people call it a broom, but maybe each group had a separate name for this structure. Anyway, let's call it a broom. So an algorithm to find the minimum number of swaps for token swapping on a broom in polynomial time was given by Vaughn in a long paper that just does this. Um, also it, by Kawahara and co-authors, and also our group did this unaware of the other things. So this middle one gives actually the simplest algorithm and ours gives the simplest proof. It's not really that simple. It's, I think it's more than five pages and, and densely written to do it. So let me tell you the algorithm just because it, I'll tell you this simple algorithm because it's incredibly simple. And the thought that you need in their case, like 10 pages to prove that this works is just kind of mind boggling to me. And it's some, I don't know, indication of just how tricky token swapping can be. So here's the algorithm that finds the optimum number of swaps. Um, I start from K equals N down to one. So I'm trying to get the maximum number token here, right? Nine, eight, seven, six, and then five, four, three, two, one. That's my target. Um, and I say, okay, while there is a token here that wants to go into the star part, I'm gonna do that swap. So one will swap here where it wants to go to vertex one, two comes here. Oh, token two wants to go into the star. It goes here, seven comes here. Now seven doesn't wanna go into the star. It wants to go over here. So I say, okay, I'm done with this little while loop. Now I move token nine home. So token nine zips all the way over to here with the, uh, you know, one, two, three, four swaps. Meanwhile, token seven comes over here. So the weird and awkward thing about their algorithm is that a token like seven can go bouncing around in the star. And that's why their proof is harder. And our proof was easier, but we avoided this bouncing. So it's a little harder to describe our algorithm. Anyway, you have to admire this algorithm because in the case where the path is empty and it's just the star, it's doing exactly what you want for the star. In case the star is empty and we just have the path, it's just sending home the largest token each time. And it combines those in 
the way that works. If you combine those two in some other way, it doesn't work. And yeah, so. And one thing I'd like to note about this is that the happy tokens stay fixed by this algorithm. So that happy leaf conjecture that I disproved for you, it's true for brooms, okay? If there's a, a leaf that has the right token, you should just let it stay put. Now, one thing that's open is to extend this to colors and or weights, uh, token swapping on brooms. And another question is to go beyond uh, stars and brooms. Uh, one would be to take what we were calling a double broom here. And again, I conjecture that the happy leaf property holds for this, just because I don't see that we have in here that counterexample to the happy leaf conjecture. It doesn't mean it holds, but it's maybe some evidence. And the simplest case of that would be a twin star where the path in the middle has only one edge. So, so th this might actually be quite easy to show that it satisfies the happy leaf property. And maybe it's even easy to do token swapping in polynomial time. We, we've never tried. Um, okay, so let me tell you next about um, some approximation algorithms and a better justification for why we're looking at approximation algorithms is that, is that the problem is NP complete, okay? But I'll tell you the approximation algorithms first. Historically, they came first. So there are three independently discovered polynomial time algorithms that have a factor of two approximation. All three of those algorithms fix the happy leaves. So we know that they're not optimal. We know that there's a way to do fewer steps. And one thing we were able to prove is that any time we have an algorithm that's gonna keep the happy leaves fixed, it's not gonna do better than an approximation factor of four thirds. And that proof is fairly easy. We look at this little tree and I say, I want to reverse these blue tokens. So K prime should go over here, K should go there. I, I just want to reverse the path. Now attached to the center of the path, I have K leaves that currently are happy. They have the token they want to have, okay? So if I fix the happy leaves, then I, I only have a path that I need to reverse and it's gonna take me this many swaps. And so we're gonna describe something that's better um, if, I, if I move these happy tokens. And the idea, oops, let me back up just one. The idea is um, to swap the tokens here, the X tokens with A, and that will take roughly K squared over two. I'm ignoring lower order terms here. Then I'm going to swap A, which is now here with A prime, and that'll, that'll get my, these blue tokens K through one in the right place here. And then finally, I have A prime here, I'm gonna swap it with X here. And now the funny thing is that X ends up in reverse order, so I have to adjust that. But that's token swapping on a star, which is a linear number of swaps. So really what we're stuck with is the three times k squared over two and the ratio of two to uh, three halves is my four thirds. So that's, that's the proof here. So it's a bad idea to keep those happy leaves fixed, but all three of those algorithms do it. <clears throat> now, uh, yeah, what this kind of tree, um, we were calling this one a double handled broom. And we know that for an optimum solution, I ought to move those happy tokens, but how should I do it for the optimum? We don't know the answer. I only said that this was better. I didn't say that it was the optimum way. So that's another open question. Okay, so let me mention for you these uh, three different approximation algorithms. Um, one was first discovered by Akers and Krishnamurthy in that um, sorting network paper and independently um, in a 2016 paper. Now, to be fair, th this 2016 paper was showing an approximation algorithm for general graphs. And then they said, oh, in the special case, when we have a tree, it's giving us factor two. So they really did a lot more. Um, Vaughn, again, had an algorithm for this in 95, unaware of, of this work. And finally, there's uh, what we're calling a cycle algorithm that was in the paper that first called this token swapping. So um, what's intriguing to me is not only that, you know, 
groups did this independently, but they, the algorithms are, are very different. Um, so let me show you a bit about them, see how far I get. Um, so the idea of the first one is that if I look at a token and I say, okay, it's currently here, it wants to go to some other place, there's a unique path from where it is to where it wants to go. It certainly has to make a swap on every one of those edges. You know, it might do such a swap and then go off and explore some crazy other thing, and, but it has to swap on each of those edges. So if I have the situation where this token S has a destination to the right and token T has a destination to the left, then if I swap those two, both S and T are doing a swap they need to do. So we call that a happy swap. It's not that they, the tokens become happy, they just become happier, if you like. Um, now, it's not always possible to do that. For, for example, um, if, if I, even if I have a path of odd length, the token in the middle is happy and it blocks anyone else from switching to where it wants to go. So we also need another operation, which is called a shove. And that is when I have a happy token, but somebody really wants to go past it, then I let it do that. And S becomes unhappy when I do it. Now, um, if D is the sum of all the path, path lengths, I was just arguing, we need D over two swaps because at, at most we can decrease D by two in a single swap, that's what's happening here. But here D is staying the same. So in order to argue that this gives a, a factor two approximation, we have to say, what is it that improves when I'm doing this? And in fact, the thing that improves is that S used to be in a trivial cycle and T was in some cycle, you know, T wanted to go someplace and so on. And now they, they enter the same cycle together. So the number of cycles decreases. And that's the, the trick to, to showing that there's a, um, uh, oops, excuse me. I lost my, my thing. Um, that's the trick to showing that this gives you a factor two. So the algorithm is that we do the happy swaps when possible, we do the shoves when necessary, we have to prove that a shove exists, that's not too hard. We have to prove factor two, that's also not too hard. Um, so it fixes happy leaves, it's optimal on a path, it's not optimal in this situation because I would never do this swap here that is sort of the secret to making this work efficiently. The other intriguing thing to notice is what is the route that a token takes? It goes on the path to its destination. And once it's there, it might be shoved out one edge. Oh, now it has to go back to its destination. It might be shoved out by one place. So it, it travels the path to the destination and then it can bounce around one, one away from that, but very limited. Now, Vaughn was thinking more mathematically. So I think computer scientists tend to think, I wanna get from here to here, I'm gonna have an algorithm that starts here, does something, and I recurse on the rest of the list. And that's what that happy swap algorithm is doing. Whereas Teresa Vaughn was thinking groups and uh, creating a sequence of swaps. And the whole problem is totally symmetric. If you start with the destinations and ask to go to the initial configuration of tokens. So she builds her sequence of swaps from the start and the end symmetrically. And when she recurses, she recurses on a subproblem in the middle. So she does a happy swap, but she also looks and says, well, if token S wants to go, it, it, the destination of token S is here, but its initial configuration is to the right. And token T has a final destination here, but an initial destination over here then I could do that swap at the end of my sequence. It's just looking at the problem from the other end. And because of that, the kind of shove that she needs to do is a much more limited thing. So I have a happy token, it and its destination are in the same place, um, but I have a token that wants to go this way and a destination that wants to go that way to its initial. And then I do this swap. And the intriguing thing here is that um, this third operation takes two swaps, but all of these operations decrease D by two. So it's immediate that you get the factor two approximation. What's not quite immediate is you need to show that if you cannot do this or this, you can always do the third kind of operation. 
So it's a very interesting uh, uh, algorithm. Now, these this time tokens may travel far from their shortest paths. I, I don't know a way to analyze that exactly. And the third algorithm deals with the cycles and it deals with them one at a time. And I've written it here in a very succinct way, but it's uh, you have to be really careful. So each cycle, I'm going to take each token one at a time. So token one wants to go here where token two is. So I move it, but I stop one short. Now token, and let me show you the next picture. Token two wants to go to where token three is, but I stop one short. Now, when token three travels to token four, it bumps two to the right place, three stops one short, and four, when it travels to its place, it bumps three to the right place, bumps one to the right place, and it goes home. Um, but it's actually also important that I'm swapping a token to the next token, not to its destination, but to the next token, which may have moved. So it, it, it's a, it's a subtle and complicated thing. And they prove that it has a factor of two. Um, tokens always stay within distance one of their shortest paths, which is interesting as well. So one thing we were able to do in that first paper is show that the approximation factor of two is tight for these algorithms. That is for each of these algorithms, there is an example tree where it really does take factor of two. And more generally in the second paper, we were able to prove that if tokens don't go too far from their source to destination path, then we're always gonna get approximation factor at least two. So here are two examples where uh, this token, it takes a detour that takes it far from its path. So that is not, that is violating the property we're suggesting here. And another way to violate the property is to go somewhere on the path, but then backtrack too far. So if neither of these situations hold, um, then our approximation, if, yeah, to put it more clearly, if our approximation algorithm never allows these two things to happen, then the approximation factor is gonna be at most two. And um, although Vaughn's algorithm doesn't respect this property, we could prove the factor two as well for that. And let me maybe not get into this example that shows all these lower bounds, but just say it's an open question whether there is an approximation algorithm that does better than a factor of two. And the weird thing is that such an algorithm will have to move tokens far away from their shortest paths, or maybe move happy tokens very far away from where they belong and then move them back. So that makes it mm, much more tricky to think of how such an algorithm might work. Okay, so then let me tell you just a little bit about NP hardness. And I, I am aware that no one wants to see the details of NP hardness, but let me tell you the idea. Um, so remi a reminder of which problem we're looking at. I have a tree with vertices, tokens numbered one to N. I have some limit K and I'm asking, can I get all the tokens to their right places with at most K swaps, right? So this looks like my example from before. I don't have the edge here though. It is a tree now, right? Okay. So the first step is to show that if I have zero one weights on my tokens, then the problem is NP complete. And that's actually very manageable to do that. The idea is that each token has a weight, either zero or one. And when I do a swap of two tokens, I charge the sum of their weights. So it might be two, it might be that one of them has a weight of zero, then I'm charging only one, or it might be that they're both free and then the swap costs nothing. So the problem that we reduce from is called permutation generation in Gary and Johnson. And I've drawn it sort of as a picture. So the idea is it's really token swapping in a star. Um, I have these tokens, C, B, D, and A. I want to sort them. I would like to have A, B, C, and D. Um, what I call these things, I call them slots here, these leaves. And I have one token or one item that's in my hand currently. Now, the difference from token swapping on a star is that we are told at each step which edge we may use. 
So in the first step, I can only use edge three. I could swap what I have in my hand with what's in slot three. I could do it or I could choose not to do it. So I know Michael liked to call this problem swap or not. <laughs> and then in the second step, I may use edge one. I have no other choices. I can use it or not use it. In step three, I can use edge two if I want. So this particular example has a solution. The swaps that I do are, I don't do the, those two. And let me show you how that works. So in the first step, I'm swapping on the edge three and Z goes into the slot three and D goes into my hand. In step two, I'm skipping this one, I'm skipping this one. So next I'm swapping on edge four, A comes into my hand and now token D is in its home. Um, I next do slot one and I do that swap. So A goes home, C is in my hand and one final swap on edge three sorts the whole thing, okay? So the difference here is that I'm told this sequence and at each step in my swap sequence, I, I have to either use that edge or not use that edge, but I've got no other choices. So that's the problem we're starting from. Now, how do I turn that problem with its given sequence into a token swapping problem? So here's the construction we use. I've now written um, like this, this vertex has token A initially and it wants to have D. So I'm using a different notation for things. Um, these, I have a long path, its length is the length of my sequence. And then I have a path here for each slot. And I have these special token, special vertices, which I'm coloring red that correspond to the four slots here. And um, when I swap a black token, it costs me one. When I swap a red token, it costs zero. These black tokens, the, uh, the primed ones here, six prime, five prime, and so on, they want to move to the left. And the unprimed tokens, four, one, three, and six, and so on, they want to move. I got my left and right backwards. They want to move to the left. And if you look, for example, why have I put token one here? The reason is that in my sequence, the first swap I'm allowed to do is a swap into slot three. So I put number one for my first operation into slot three. And I say that token one has to go to the end of my list here. Okay, I want to end up with one, two, three, four, five, six in order on the path. Now, what is my goal in this token swapping problem? I want to swap with the absolute minimum which is that I want my cost to be the sum of the distances that the black tokens have to move. It's absolutely necessary that I spend at least this and I'm asking, can I do it with exactly that? Okay, so token one is gonna have to make one, two, three, four, five, six, seven swaps. And I say, it cannot do any more than that. Now, if I think what happens if I put some other black token into this uh, path before token one, that would be bad, 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 because then I would have to switch one and four and four would be moving backwards and that would cost me too much. So I absolutely have to move token one in here first. And when I do that swap, one goes here and Z goes here. And it's sort of like I've moved my hand close to the three slot because now I can swap my red Z token with my red D token for free. It costs me zero to do that swap because they're both red. So that's accomplishing that, yes, I may do this swap if I choose, or I can skip it if I choose and it costs all the same, whichever choice I make, okay? So then I proceed and token one goes all the way where it should go. Token one prime goes where it should go. And now I look next at token two. And that's what's going to allow me to, um, to, 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 uh, to choose to do or not do the, the second swap there. Okay, so I'm hoping that gives you some idea of that proof. Um, and then the second step is to eliminate those weights. We had zero one weights and we need to eliminate those weights. And the trouble is that now those weight zero swaps have to cost something. And I don't know how many I'm gonna use. I had my sequence of length six and I chose to use only four of those, but maybe I would have needed all six of them and I don't know the difference. So um, the solution to that is to make 
so many weight one tokens by duplicating them that they totally overwhelm those free slots that I now have to charge one for. And so in place of each token that I used to have here, I'm gonna have a whole bunch of tokens, a whole long row of tokens that are all acting, playing the same role. Well, but that opens another can of worms, which is now there is no reason I need to keep those duplicates together. And so all chaos can break out when I'm swapping in this tree. So to give you some notion, I gave you the idea of this proof to write it down properly it takes us like three pages. To write down this one properly it took us like, well, it took Jason and Nicole several months and then it took the rest of us several more months, many months actually, to write it down rigorously and properly. And it's still like 30 pages, it's horrendous. It's the longest NP completeness proof I've ever been involved in. And I, I wish not to be involved in one that long ever again in my life. Okay, so this is a picture of what we truly need. We need not only these long things, but we need little groups of smaller things that come out of the slots at the right time. And it's very complicated. So enough on that. Um, let me say one more thing, switch gears entirely and talk about parallel token swapping. Uh, so as I mentioned, this is called routing permutations via matchings. And the idea is that in one round, I can swap simultaneously on edges that form a matching. So in this little graph, token one wants to travel distance two, every token wants to travel distance two. So if I were doing it sequentially, I, I would need at least four swaps but I can do it with just two rounds. So in the first round, I, I swap on the two vertical edges. And in the second round, I swap on the two horizontal edges, two rounds and everybody got where they want to go. So the number of rounds, an upper bound, a worst case bound on this, uh, there was one proved in this initial paper, but an improved bound is three halves n uh, plus order log n. And the distance problem was known to be NP-complete on general graphs. And what we did was show that it's NP-complete on trees and even on very special trees, namely spiders. So speaking of spiders, um, here are some open questions. I'm back to the sequential token swapping. I showed you the path at first. I showed you the star done independently by three people, the broom, done independently by three different groups of people, polynomial time. Um, I suggested that these kinds of trees, the happy leaf property should probably even hold. So surely we should be able to solve token swapping in polynomial time, but I don't actually know how. And this two-handled broom, the happy leaf property doesn't hold, but still really, can things be hard on such a simple tree? I doubt it. Um, spider is also open. It's hard for the parallel token swapping, but for sequential token swapping, we don't know that. The kind of tree we needed was like a spider, but with these extra red vertices dangling off some of the spider legs. So this is what, where we know it's NP-complete. So, you know, where's this divide between P and NP-complete? We don't know. Um, another question to do with approximation is, can we do better than that factor two? I showed you that the three known algorithms, those cannot do better than factor two, but maybe there's some totally other algorithm that moves tokens far away from their paths and that does better. And similarly, there is a known four approximation algorithm for general graphs. And even for that specific algorithm, the factor four is not known to be tight. We tried that a little bit and couldn't do that. Um, Finally, I was concentrating on the distance problem, but like for people doing the, 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 the sorting network, the thing that's the most intriguing to them is what's the diameter of the Cayley graph? And what is the complexity of computing the diameter of the Cayley graph? That's a wide open question. It's not a question that's in NP, uh, it's, it's harder than that, but you know, what is its complexity? And finally, I'm, I told you briefly about parallel token swapping, but that's not the complexity of the distance problem, like how many rounds do I need, is not known for a path for the parallel token swapping, which again seems like something that should be something you could try. And I'll leave you with a warning, uh, since token swapping has taken up many, many, many hours of my life, that it's like eating popcorn. It's addictive and, and, and hard. Uh, maybe eating popcorn is not hard, but token swapping is. 
So thank you. With that, I'll open it up for questions. Thank you so much, Anna. Uh, so do we have any questions? Ah, there is a hand. Please go ahead, GJ. Is it is it me? So, so Anna, you were the last question you you posed was was about the complexity of computing the diameter of the Cayley graph. So, so how isn't that a sparse language? So, so it's so I, I'm just curious. So, how many Cayley graphs are there of a fixed size? Um, I guess I'm not sure. I mean, if we're looking at a graph with n vertices, then the Cayley graph has n factorial vertices. And I guess we could say how many edges it has in terms of the number of edges of the graph originally. Yeah. Uh, no. No. Sorry. I. I think I'm not making. I'm not making any sense. I got confused. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um. There's a lot of work following on Akers and Krishnamurthy. So mostly in the engineering type of literature, where they gave various heuristics to try to estimate the diameter. So you have a given tree. And you're trying to say, what's my worst case arrangement of tokens that's going to cause me the most swaps? So you try to start placing tokens so that, you know, there's a token here and it wants to go to the furthest uh, vertex in the tree. And, and you start trying to design this and proving something about how many swaps are needed. But it's very um, sort of ad hoc, I would say. Ruhe, you have a question? Yeah. Uh... May I have one question? Okay, so um, when you are considering the NP hardness, uh, do you need long paths? I mean, if the depth of the tree yes. is constant, do you think can you solve it in polynomial time? Um, uh, I believe that might follow from some of the work on the complexity of token swapping, this paper by Bonnet mm -hmm. and Miltzel and a Polish author whose name I cannot say, but starts with the letter R. Um, I kind of think in there, because they have something about bounded tree width and um, that would be the place to check for that answer. I, I know I checked it a few days ago and by, by now I forget the answer. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Ivan? And uh, could you show me, please, the last open question? Yeah. Yeah. So is it hard to determine the number of swapping or number of rounds? The uh, number of rounds for the parallel token swapping, right? Yeah. But is it true that, uh, like, we could use what even uh, sorting, right? Um, I guess I'm not sure. So I'm not quite as familiar with the algorithms for parallel token swapping, like the papers that have followed up on Elon and uh, Chung and Graham. There, there is a set of papers that have followed up. And I mean, that would be the place to look to get more insight into this. Um, I'm pretty sure this really is an open question. And why it's, I, I mean, it seems mind boggling that it is not settled. I guess that's a little bit what you're asking. Can't we do it in some easy I way? Mean, and, there, and I don't know. Are there uh, examples where like uh, an easy uh, greedy algorithm does not succeed? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. Uh, uh, I don't, off the top of my head, know such examples. Um, just that I would look in those papers that refer to that one. Uh, some good people have looked at this question. So right. not to mention that Alan and, and Graham looked at it, right? So thank you very much.
You're welcome. Thank you. Any other questions? Now let me ask, uh, so all of these results are about finding out exact answer or approximating exact answer. Are there, is there anything interesting type of results where you can say for this class of graphs, you can always do it with big old blah, and the blah is somehow a property of a graph. I mean, the obvious one is the diameter, but that's boring. Like diameter times n seems like an, it's an obvious thing that we get from your first example. But is there anything else that, any other results of that kind? Yeah. So again, that paper by Bonnet and Meltzo and, and the third author, um, they were looking at tree width, for example. Oh, I see. So um, they did look at yeah. this connectivity. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So they got they got close to proving hardness on trees, but they had something that's a tree except for one vertex. But like that one vertex makes all the difference because it's connected to almost anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, okay. Any other questions? Okay, thank you, Anna, for a wonderful talk. So let's thank the speaker. Yeah. Thank you.